I hope everybody's doing well this morning. It's great to be here with you on the Sabbath. Um, I want to start the, the message by asking a question. Is there anything that bothers you as you live in the world, as you go about doing your day, daily activities? Do you ever get offended by anything? Maybe offended is too strong of a word. Maybe more like something happens and it's like, ah, that doesn't make me feel very good. What are some examples of things that, uh, you know, think of some examples in your mind, personally. The kids and I talked about an example that uh, I'm sure if any of you are on Facebook or anything, you'll probably connect with this. But, uh, you know, there's this thing with Facebook where everybody puts uh, all these pictures all the time, and these families, they're like perfect, right? Because they're always out there showing all these pictures, and they're doing all these fun activities. And, uh, you know, they're, they're out with some of our friends, and, hey, I didn't know that they were going to that restaurant. They usually invite us. They didn't invite us this time. Has that ever happened to any of you? Can you kind of connect with something like that? You start to feel like, huh, what's up with that? How come we weren't invited? Or you might think, wow, boy, they're doing all these activities. Did you see that? They're having so much fun. And maybe we should start doing more stuff. That ever happened to you? Something like that? What's behind that feeling? I mean, should we get upset about stuff like that? Just looking at Facebook? Let me give you another example. I'm going to hit this topic from a little bit of a different angle, because I, you might, uh, it's, it might take a little bit uh, to understand where I'm going with this. So. Here's another example. Get into an argument with uh, maybe a spouse. And um, maybe you, you do something, you say something, and you don't think that they're hearing you. And you raise your voice a little bit. You know, that's not what I said! If anyone's ever been married, I'm sure that phrase has come up at some point in your relationship. And probably the tone of voice got a little bit elevated. Then the next question might be, well, why are you yelling at me? Well, you made me yell at you. You made me do that. You got me upset. You got me upset. Has that ever happened to you? Has any of us ever said something like that along those terms? that we ended up getting upset, and in the heat of the moment, we're like, why did you do that? Why are you yelling at me? Well, because you're making me this way. Is that good? Is that justified? What do you think? If you think that that's okay to get upset when someone else does something, quote, triggers you, is it justified? If you all think it's justified, raise your hands. Nobody's hands are going up. Has anyone ever experienced something like that? Raise your hand. Every single hand's up. <laughs> all right. So what's the driver behind that? So the two stories are actually related. Do you know how they're related? They're related and the thing that drives that behavior, drives that mentality. They're related in, in, with the Facebook example. You have to come to a conclusion in your mind about that scenario of all your friends being out on Facebook and you not being invited to make you get emotionally upset about it. Same thing in that argument that you had where you kind of lose control of your emotions and you blame the other person. Something external to you that you didn't have any control of, you're blaming for your bad behavior. What's that called? What I want to talk about today, brethren, the title of this sermon is called The Victim Trap. The victim trap. 
there's actually quite a bit about this concept of victimhood. Now think about it. The Facebook example. They didn't treat me right. I'm a victim. I'm a victim of their not inviting me out with all the friends. What's up with that? See where I'm going with that? Or with this example of your spouse in the argument. I'm a victim of you treating me in a way that got me upset. Yeah, there's a bug flying around here. <laughs> Discipline is also another Christian trait. <laughs> Ignore the bug. For those on the camera, the entire audience is looking over here at a bug flying around. I will not be a victim of a bug, trust me. <laughs> so I want to read a definition. I looked at Wikipedia, looked up victim mentality. And you know, br brethren, you can look this up. It's actually quite a hot topic on psychiatry today, different, uh, different psychology type of forums. It's a real thing. It's not something that people are making up. So victim mentality, Wikipedia, is an acquired personality trait. I might argue whether it's acquired or whether it's in our nature. I actually believe it's in our nature, and I'm going to kind of give you a, some evidence of that. But I'm just reading Wikipedia. is an acquired personality trait in which a person tends to recognize or consider themselves as a victim of the negative actions of others and to behave as if this were the case in the face of contrary evidence, such as circumstances. Okay, so basically, um, we blame our behavior on being the fact that we're victims of someone else doing something, something external to us. So as the term is also used as a reference to the tendency to blame one's misfortunes on somebody else's misdeeds. So I'm not happy with my life. And the reason I'm not happy with it is because, you know, the company I work for is blah, 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 whatever. Or because um, my coach is playing favorites to somebody else, not giving me enough attention, or whatever it is. We blame somebody else for our misfortunes. That's victim mentality, according to Wikipedia. I want to turn back, and I, I said I was going to make a point that I actually think that victimhood is built into us. It's something we all deal with from time to time. None of us is immune to it. And I want to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, because not only did this victim mentality impact us, but brethren, <laughs> it was right there with the first human beings. Genesis chapter 3. I'm just going to go ahead and read the whole chapter. I think it's a, it's a good opportunity to kind of go through this and key in on this. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. So yes, it's acknowledging that the serpent was subtle or the, this being was subtle had power um, than anything else in the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Tempting. Just a provocative question. And the woman said unto the serpent, Oh, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, that one which God has said you shall not eat of eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, She who shall not surely die. Hmm. Probably the first time Eve even considered that. You mean God might be lying to me? Hmm. For God does not, for God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good for evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, so she started to kind of buy into what this serpent, Satan, we know, is, 
is telling her. She's starting to buy into it. Oh, yeah, it looks, looks pretty good to eat. I'd like to try that. I'd like to try it. It was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. Oh, if it can make me like God. You know, I wonder why God doesn't want me to have it. She took of the fruit thereof and eat, did eat and gave it unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now, there wasn't a lot of detail about that whole interaction between even her husband, but uh, any one of us that have been in a relationship probably know it was more complicated than that. There was probably some discussion and convincing going on. Nonetheless, they ended up eating. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. In other words, I take this as they realized that they had made a mistake. They knew that what they just did, I and mean, how, how many of us have went through that? We're doing something, kind of in the back of our mind, we know that it might not be right, but we kind of push it in the back of our mind because we really want to do it. And then afterwards, we had that time of reflection and go, I can't believe I did that. I should know better than that. Ugh. I'm a Christian! I shouldn't have let myself do that. I mean, we've all had those moments, right? That's how I interpret this when it says their eyes were opened. They realized they did something wrong. They were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard. Now they were ashamed. They were ashamed. And then they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. Uh oh! Mom and dad are home. Hide the candy. Uh-oh. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam, Adam, Eve, where are you? And Adam, he said, and he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you that you should not eat? And the man said, The woman made me do it. Well, you made me say that. Well, well, Dad, you shouldn't have left the cookie jar out. It's your fault. The man said, the woman who you gave me. Actually, what's Adam doing here? The woman who you gave me. That's right. I'm not the one who did it. I mean, you gave me this woman. She made me do it. It's your fault, God. I mean, think about that. Adam was actually blaming God. The woman that you gave me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat it. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. So, brethren, we see right from the beginning that Adam and Eve, that first sin, they played the victim. Now, there's a whole bunch of bad that comes from playing the victim, and I'm going to get into that in a little bit. But I just want to make the point here, brethren, that I think it's part of our nature. Now we say when we go into the waters of baptism, we're to do what? Leave the old man behind. What does that mean, the old man? The nature, the human nature. Leave that stuff behind. And we're going to come up fresh and new and clean. And Passover is a new man, new woman. Well, we're to take on God's nature. Now I don't think God's nature is to play the victim but man's nature is. 
That's the point I wanted to make here with these verses. That it's something that we have to acknowledge, brethren, that it's, it's part of our nature. None of us are immune to it. We have to be mindful. And I think when we're aware, that's the first step in helping to overcome it. Now, what are some of the benefits? There are actual benefits of playing the victim, aren't there? What are some of the benefits of playing the victim? Well, I mean, we don't have to take accountability for our own actions. It's always somebody else's fault. It's not us. I'm not the one that ate the apple. Eve made me do it. It's her, it's her fault. We tend to be able to justify our wrongdoing. We're righteous. You know, I, I know I lied on my insurance claim, but after all, that insurance company's been stealing money from me for 30 years. They're, I'm a victim here of this big evil insurance company. They're flying their jets around. I'm going to get my claim. That's a benefit, isn't it? I got my money. It justifies wrongdoing. Makes us feel okay about it. Benefits of playing the victim. We receive pity. Oh, that's okay, Dave. I'm with you. Oh, that's okay. We like that. We like when people pity us sometimes. People are less likely to criticize us when we're playing the victim. You know, the people that always have the black cloud over them, no matter what, seems like they're always, something is always befalling them. They're always telling you about their problems, about everything, how everything, they just can't get a break. Are these real benefits or maybe perceived benefits? People walk on eggshells around you. Nobody wants to offend you. People will expect less of you when you're always playing the victim. Because after all, you're a victim. Maybe the biggest perceived benefit is that you can manipulate people by playing the victim. Maybe even manipulate people into giving you stuff. So, what's the problem with this, brethren? Why is victim mentality not good? And I'll start going into some scriptures here in a little bit, but the number one, I put five reasons here why victim mentality, and you can get a bunch of stuff from literature, but I try to summarize them into these five probably the most important, and this one alone could be the only reason why we should say we are going to try to overcome this victim mentality ourselves as Christians. Number one, victim mentality leads to unhappiness. Just like I said before, I'll give credit to Dennis Prager. Whether you like him or not, agree or not, I have to give him credit for this saying, I love it, happy people make the world better, unhappy people make the world worse. Victim mentality, when you see yourself as a victim, it's very hard to be happy. You see the world as being unjust. We live in an unjust world, and that's all we're focused on. And we're the victims of the unjust world. It's very difficult to be happy. When we're unhappy, guess what? The people around us are unhappy. When the people around us are unhappy, the people around them are unhappy. Unhappy people make the world worse. Happy people make people around them happy, and vice versa. Happy people make the world better. If that was the only reason we should avoid being victims, brethren, that's good enough for me. Jesus says that our, he's, he wants us to have joy. That our joy should be full as Christians. There were to be lights under the world, not downers. 
The victim mentality can stifle productivity in our lives. I think of productivity as this manufacturing thing at work. You know, we want to be more productive. But we want our lives to be productive. We want to produce what? Fruit. We want to have productive lives. Uh, victim mentality prevents us from developing the traits that we need to to be successful. Because we don't take accountability for our, for our situation. I shared an example with Michael and Allie on the way here. They said, Dad, don't use that in the sermon. Sorry, it's a good example. This example of um, the Facebook with friends. Well, how could you take that? So going back to that Facebook example, you're, you see your friends on Facebook all at a, a party and you weren't invited. So what could you do? Well, Michael said, well, if that happens, maybe, maybe instead of being upset thinking that... Uh, you know, why, did, why didn't they invite me? Maybe I'll look internally. Well, maybe I can be a better friend. Actually, I still think that's being a little bit of a victim. Maybe a better way is to say, hey, I'm glad they had a good time. Sometimes I like to have, hang out with just a couple of my friends, and not all my friends. Maybe they just wanted to hang out with those friends that day, and it has nothing to do with my relationship with them. See, if I don't play the victim, then that's just a harmless activity, and I'm happy that they had a great time. That's a, hey, where did you go? That looks like a nice restaurant. Maybe next time we go, we're going to take you guys there. As opposed to getting in this mindset, why didn't they invite me? I'm a victim. It stifles growth. It stifles productivity. It hinders relationships. It undermines healthy relationship building. So take that example of the Facebook thing. I'm a victim. I'm offended. Next time I go out, guess what? I'm not inviting you. Well, then now they're offended. Next time they go out, they're not inviting me. And then now I'm even more offended. I guess, I rela I guess that's not the friend I thought we had. I, th I guess that's not the relationship I thought we had. Now we're not friends anymore. You see how that could be this vicious cycle that leads to broken relationships? Victim mentality can also lead to real injustice because we're getting back, we're getting even. The example of the insurance company. Is it just? Is it right? to maybe bend the truth a little bit to get your insurance claim? I'm not saying any of us have done that, but I know that that's something that happens in life, so I'm using it as an example. But would that be, is that right or just? No, that's an injustice. That's not right. But it's justified in our minds because of this whole victim mentality. Think of it in terms of... Uh, I'm, let me just use an example. Class envy. Rich people. Oh, I hate rich people. Oh, look at them on their yacht. I work just as hard as they do. Why do they get a yacht and not me? Oh, raise their taxes. Isn't that victim mentality a little bit? Is it just? Maybe they worked hard and really earned it. Maybe they, really, they, they started a family business and worked hard for 20, 30 years and are finally enjoying the fruits of their labors. And they've created a ton of value for people. Maybe we should be happy for them. Hey, I'm happy you're successful. No, I'm envious. You see where I'm going with this? This victim mentality can lead to a lot of bad things. It could lead to real injustice. And to the extreme, brethren, I want to read another excerpt from Wikipedia. Similarly, quote, 
criminals often engage in victim thinking, believing themselves to be moral and engaging in crime only as a reaction to the immoral world, and furthermore, feeling that authorities are unfairly singling them out for persecution. Hey, it's okay for me to rob this store. I'm a victim. It's justified. This is a serious problem. That's happening, isn't it? So I hope that you understand why victim mentality is something that we need to avoid and get, o- get our minds free of, get over it. So how do we break the cycle, brethren? Number one, first thing, there's three things that I think we can do to overcome victim mentality. First and foremost, we have to acknowledge that we're susceptible to it and that it's not healthy. Here are some indicators, things that we can be mindful of. Complaining. If we find ourselves complaining a lot, it could be a sign of victim mentality. We tend to complain, we're blaming others of why things aren't fair, what's happening. Anger. Are we angry at something? Do we go through the day angry at what's happening in the news? Angry at that group over there? Or angry at those politicians? Or angry at uh, this group of friends? Or angry somewhere? Are we angry people? Do we have times and how much percent of our day is, are we angry? I mean, Jesus says, you know, be angry and sin not. I take that as very few minutes of our day should we really be angry. So if we start to find that we're kind of angry all the time about something, that's a sign, brethren, that we might have some victim mentality issues. Demonization. Judging people or groups, making judgments about them, demonizing them. Are there, is there anybody in your life that you really dislike? Be honest. Why? Maybe because we feel they've victimized us in some way. Apathy. There are certain people that we just don't care about. I don't really care what happens to that person. Yeah, that person, or those types of people, those people. You know, I, I, I like those people, but I, I could care less about them. A sign, brethren, that you might look. Maybe the driver is that you feel like you're a victim of something that they're doing. Narcissism and self-pity. Oh, woe is me. Oh, I have so many problems. Being defensive. Why are you always attacking me? None of us are defensive. How about justifying behavior? If we find ourselves justifying things, maybe it's because of victim mentality. Turn with me to... uh, Let me see. Turn with me to John chapter 5. I just want to read this real quickly. John chapter 5. Jesus about the paralytic man. And I didn't write the exact scripture in, so I've got to find it real quickly here. Okay, here we go. Okay, right at the beginning. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. 
Je uh, verse 1, chapter 5. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is a Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Beth or Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of important folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season in the, into the pool and troubled the water. Who, whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. So there was a man going to this pool to try to get healed and he was, had some problem. For thirty-eight years he dealt with this. When Jesus saw him lie and he knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Will you be made whole? Will you? Do you really want to be healed? Why would Jesus ask that question? Of course! He's been going there for 38 years! Why do you think Jesus asked him that question? Do you really want to be healed? Well, maybe he's been going there playing the victim. Maybe Jesus wanted to figure out what was in this guy's heart. If he really did want to be healed, or if he actually maybe enjoyed some of the attention he got by going down to that pool every day for 38 years. Maybe all the help he got, all the pity he got, all those perceived benefits. The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me in the pool, but while I am coming another steps down before me, Jesus said unto him. So Jesus somehow must have determined that his desire to be made whole was sincere. He said, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And he did. So just the fact, brethren, that this example, I think that for me, I see here that Jesus wanted to know if this man wanted to play the victim or really was sincere in wanting to become better and be healed. I think we have to get that in our mind first. So to be, start to get over this, we have to, one, truly not want to be victims. Number two, we have to be internally focused, internally motivated as opposed to externally motivated. What do I mean there? How many of you get upset by the weather? I do. It's a nice sunny day. We're in a good mood. It's raining and cold. Come on, admit it. How many of us get in a bad mood when it's rainy and cold? Okay. Now, how good are we at controlling the weather? I mean, I can kind of do it, but I'm working on it. <laughs> you know, if I think really, really hard sometimes, I, gotta, I just think of the sun, sometimes I see the sun come out. That, I think I'm controlling the weather. No, you know what I'm saying. How many of us can control the weather? So why do we let it affect our mood? We can't control it. The person that can have a positive, sunny disposition on a cold 35, 36 degree rainy day in Cleveland is an internally motivated person. They don't let external factors control them. They have internal factors that control them. Internal factors that control them. Someone who is controlled by an internal factor doesn't say, you made me upset. Because they know that no one can make me upset. I choose to be upset based on what I saw. 
Everything I do, everything I say, everything I think is controlled by what? A spirit connected to gray matter up here. We have the power to control everything we think and do in our lives. That's an internal motivation, to understand that. What does Jesus say? When I return, or after I uh, die, and he told the apostles and John, I'm going to bring you a comforter, and it's going to give you power. Isn't that what Jesus is talking about? Internal motivation. External motivation is a belief that things outside of their people's lives are in control of them. That their lives are futile, unfair, unjust. There's nothing I can do about it. Internally motivated people view the opposite. They realize that their lives are in their control. And they take responsibility for everything that they do. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. Because, brethren, as I look at Jesus Christ, as I understand God's character, God's values, I don't see someone who was externally motivated. Jesus Christ was the most internally motivated person in the history of mankind. He lived his life to bring about over 75 prophecies. Talk about someone in control. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. Jesus tells us, You have heard that it was said by them of old time, You shall not kill. Whosoever you shall kill shall be in the danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in the danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. And he goes on to say, brethren, that we are to be perfect. We are to be perfect. Jesus wouldn't, would Jesus tell us to control our thoughts if he knew that we didn't have control over our thoughts? Think about it. The very fact that Jesus is telling us to control our thoughts means that we have control over them. We can do it. I hope that no one that hears this sermon ever says that again to anybody. You made me upset. Because it's impossible. Truth be known, brethren, the truth, the hard truth, is that we chose to be upset. We, cho we chose it. We can choose not to be. In that Facebook example, I can just choose to be happy for my friends that they had a great time and not be upset by the fact that I didn't get invited. Simple as that. I have the power to do so, especially with God's Holy Spirit connected in my mind. We need to avoid phrases like, you made me do it. Avoid phrases like, you make me feel this way. Avoid phrases that, um, with the word you in them. I chose this. I did this. Take responsibility and accountability for ourselves. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm just going to go ahead and read it. You can turn there if you want to. 2 Corinthians 5, 9. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done. According to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Deuteronomy 24, 16. The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Right there in Scripture, brethren, we read that God is holding us personally accountable for our behavior. God's not gonna, that, that excuse to God's not going to fly. Why did you do that? Well, because that insurance company did this to me. Sorry. That's not going to fly with God. 
when we're standing before Jesus, he's going to have us take account for ourselves. I'm going to read in Ezekiel chapter 18, brethren. I think it would be good to read the entire chapter of Ezekiel chapter 18 where God goes into some detail about personal responsibility and accountability. I'll just read a couple excerpts here. Che Ezekiel chapter 18. Verse 4, Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sins, it shall die. Personal accountability. Let me see here. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 19. Yet you say, Why does not the Son bear the iniquity of the Father when the Son has done that which is lawful and right and hath kept all my statutes and hath done them? He shall surely live. The soul that sins, it shall die. The son, that, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father. In other words, if the Father didn't do a good job raising the Son, God's saying that's not an excuse for the Son. The Son has to be accountable for his own decisions. Why did you turn out to be a criminal? Well, my dad didn't teach me. That's not going to fly with God either. Neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. It goes the other way around. If you did a great job being a dad, and the Son ends up growing up and makes a bad choice, we tend to blame the parents. <sighs> Must be the upbringing. God's not going to do that. He's going to blame the person that made the mistake. We read right here. The Father will not bear the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. And I would encourage you to read the entire chapter of Ezekiel chapter 18. It talks about, brethren, that we absolutely, absolutely, according to God, must, as Christians and God's people, avoid being victims and take personal accountability for our lives. Power, we have the power of choice, brethren. Mind over matter. I want to get, share a couple of additional examples of the power of our mind over not being a victim. How many of us live in pain? I'm pretty proud and inspired by a number of my brethren here in the church because I know that there are some of you who live in a severe amount of pain. And yet when I see you, I see happy, smile, cheery disposition. You know, what that's, you know what that's an indication to me of? Mind over matter. Not letting an external factor, I think pain is an external factor, control your mood and your mind. Another of those indicators. Another thing we can do to avoid this trap of victimhood, brethren, is don't compare yourself to other people. Think about that. I'll give an example of a professional athlete. Athlete that makes a million dollars, millions of dollars playing the game that they love. Obviously they're happy, right? Obviously they're happy. I don't know, think of any professional athlete signing, make 20, 30 million dollars to play football or baseball. What about an actor? We all, when we're kids, we want to be famous, we want to be an actor because obviously they're happy. But what does that athlete do when all of a sudden his buddy redoes his contract and is making 10 more million dollars than him? Now, when that athlete compares himself to his, say, he goes back to his class reunion and he compares himself to all his, you know, average person in his graduating class, he should be pretty happy, shouldn't he? But what do we do as human beings? We don't do that. We tend to compare ourselves to the, 
the next highest thing that we think. Do you know how many actors commit suicide? How many famous people are unhappy? How many athletes are unhappy? Because they compare themselves to others. Here's the typical self-talk. I work just as hard as that guy. In some ways, I even make better plays. I'm more valuable than him. Why is he getting paid more than me? Those owners don't appreciate me. My agent stinks. I'm a victim of these unjust owners and a bad agent. As opposed to self-talk of, hey, I just am so happy and blessed to be playing football, playing a game I love, and they're actually paying, it, paying me for it. Victim mentality, brethren. Don't compare yourself to others. James chapter 4, verse 1. James chapter 4, verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? You lust and have not. So you don't have what the other guy has. You kill and desire to have, cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you have you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. Brethren, we're talking about envy here. Envy is a foundational trait that leads to victim mentality. I just want to read the opposite. An example of someone who did not play the victim, brethren. Someone who did not envy, who counted their blessings. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 23. Just in this context, reading this psalm, just think about David and what he re- writes here. And think about the fact of the trials and tribulations that he had in his life, the unfortunate circumstances of his life, all the challenges that he had. And yet, think of the mentality that he has in this psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I won't want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. I have a blessed life. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He heals me. He teaches me good things. He guides my life. He gives me great blessings. Yea, yes, I do walk through trials and tribulations. These happen to me. Yes, I have them. Yea, I do walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But I will fear no evil, for you are with me, God. With you on my side, all things are possible. I can get through everything. You are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. I have power in you, God. You prepare a table before me. Some way, somehow, it always seems to work out for the good in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. You heal me. My cup runs over. Here's a man, brethren, whose eyes are focused on the bounteous blessings in his life in the face of trials and tribulations. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, focusing on the ultimate healing after this life. Do you see any hint of victim mentality or victimhood in what David's writing here? Not even a hint. The third thing, brethren, that we can do to avoid this victim trap 
I kind of keyed in on it before a little bit, but I just want to call it out. We have to avoid looking at people as groups. We all do it. I admit, brethren, I tend to have looked at the opposing political party of my views as a group. What do I want to do instead? Look at everybody as an individual person. Think about that. Think about someone in a group that you really don't agree with. And have you ever painted everybody in that group with a broad brush? I don't care if it's political, if it's racial, if it's whatever it is. We're good? What was that, a wasp? Ooh. Did you get them? Yes. Okay. <laughs> but think about it. Groups can be this amorphous blob. People become real to us. Because we're not a group. We're a, we're a person. We're a person. If you really want to connect it, you know, this whole false teaching of the Trinity, this amorphous blob, blob versus God as a person, the Father is a person, Jesus is a person. You can have a relationship with a person. You can't have a relationship with a group. So brethren, don't look at people as a group. Look at them as individuals. When we feel like we are a victim of the group, we want to get back at them. Don't. Look at them as an individual. I have an example here from our Savior. Turn with me to Luke chapter 23. Now, brethren, put yourself in Jesus' shoes. He's trying to help people. He helped and healed, I don't know how many hundreds, if not thousands of people. He tried to bring the truth. He's trying to save people. And the people that he came to save decided to kill him and let a murderer go. What if that was you? Talk about being a victim. Now, I want to I make something clear. I'm not saying it's wrong to be a victim. Because that's different. We are all victims at some point or another. I'm saying there's a difference between being a victim and having a victim mentality. That's what I'm saying. I want to be very clear about that. Jesus was a victim of injustice. Yet I don't see Jesus with a victim mentality at all. I see the opposite. I see a power in Jesus. Look over here, Luke chapter 23, verse 26. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And, and there followed him a great company of people, and of women which also bewailed and lamented him. So you can read about the terrible torture that Jesus went through, the pain and suffering. And Jesus turning unto them and said, You just wait. You're going to get what's coming to you. I demand justice. No, that's not what he said. Not at all what Jesus said. Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me. These are the people that are killing him. Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves, for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the brethren and the wombs that never bear, the paps which never gave suck. Then shall begin to say, The mountains fall on us and the hills cover us. 
For if they do these things in the green tree, what shall, they, shall be done in the dry? Jesus is warning them. His mind is trying to save them still. Don't weep for me. There's no woe is me here with Jesus. He's saying, don't weep for me. If they do this to me, take, take note. He's warning them. And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, where they crucified him, and the malefactors, one of the right hand and the other on the left, then said, Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgive them. Now what would be our typical self-talk? I put some thoughts that I might be having if I were in Jesus' shoes. I'm being persecuted unjustly. Somebody needs to stand up for me. Somebody stand up for me. Where are my friends? Where'd they go? Those traitors. I guess they were never really my friends after all. They betrayed me. I'll never get close to them again. I don't deserve this. This isn't fair. Someone needs to hold them accountable for this. They need to even the score. Father, bring justice. They need to pay for this injustice. If I ever get a chance, I'll get them. Now imagine Jesus' self-talk. I try to think, what. You know, be reading between the lines here, what Jesus might have been thinking. Look at the hold that Satan has on these people. Look at the hold that he's got on them. How he's able to deceive them. My poor children, my poor brothers and sisters have been deceived. These sheep. If they knew the truth, I knew they wouldn't be doing this to me if they only knew who I really was and believed it. I know their hearts are good. They're just deceived. I'm going to save them. I'm going to go through this, and when I, when I come back, I'm going to give them a spirit that teaches them the truth, that helps them to understand. Then they're going to know, and then they're going to be my friends. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What an example, brethren. What an example. Jesus overcame a victim mentality through love. Through love. He viewed them as individuals that he cared about, gave the benefit of the doubt for. Read 1 Corinthians 13 where it says, Love suffers long. It's kind. It doesn't envy. It's not puffed up. It gives the benefit of the doubt. Jesus simply looked at them as individuals that he loved. And that helped him to avoid the victim trap. If we truly love others, brethren, if we truly love them, we won't envy them. We won't be offended. We won't feel like when they make a mistake, it was because they were being unjust to us. I think that's probably the best way to inoculate ourselves from this victimhood. The victim mentality, brethren, can be a cancer to our Christianity. Jesus tells us he wants us to be lights to the world, bring joy to the world. We're going to have trials, we're going to have tribulations, and we will have injustice because people aren't perfect. But being internally motivated people, motivated by God's Holy Spirit in us, and the power that God says we have, we can control our mood. We can control our thoughts. We can take accountability and responsibility. And doing that is the first step toward growth. We can acknowledge, brethren, that we don't want to play the victim. We want to be powerful God beings 
and set the example to others that they have the power to live good, happy lives, even in the face of all the craziness around us. And brethren, that we can avoid this by simply looking at everybody, even our enemies, as Jesus told us. Love your enemies. You do that by looking at them as people, as God's people that have similar desires, hopes, dreams, challenges as you. Maybe they're just deceived. And maybe someday they're going to be our best friend. Even, yes, that one guy that we just hate. That's God's child. That's a human being created in the image of God. And Jesus died for that person. And he tells us that we are to love him. So brethren, avoid this victim trap. Be mindful of it. Take accountability for our lives and realize the awesome power that we have to live our best, full, wonderful, happy lives. And brethren, if we do that, we will truly become those lights to the rest of the world that Jesus wants us to be.